All right, this is the Common Magician here with a follow-up to uh, guess the method trick number three. Um, I think I, at least at the, at the moment of making this video, uh, I think I've busted just about everybody. I don't think anybody has gotten it quite right yet. Uh, and there was a bit of misdirection in there that I didn't intend um, in the way that I presented it that I think threw some people off. Um, I did put a little hint in there. Uh, in the comments section uh, to kind of redirect your thoughts a little bit uh, to see if I could get some of you to find the, the right um, the right avenue of, of, of concept here. No cards were harmed in the making of this effect, so there are no crimps. Um, and there's no nail punches or any alterations to cards in any way, shape, or form. So the cards are held intact and can be examined by uh, anybody at the very end and you wouldn't find any irregularities with the cards. Now, I will say that the idea of a crimp or a, a, a nail punch in the um, presentation of the card, as was suggested, might not be a bad way to do it. It might actually be a little superior to what I did because it wouldn't require uh, the control that I put into it. Um, had I crimped the card, I wouldn't have had to necessarily look at the face of the cards. I would have been able to uh, get my card controlled where I needed it to be without ever looking at the faces. And that may have made, made the uh, effect a little bit uh, better. Um, and uh, so thank you for that idea, but that's not what I did. What I did, uh, and there's actually two parts to this. There is the acquisition of the card, or the uh, figuring out of what the, what the card is, and the second part is the reveal. Now the reveal part of this, I knew that you would probably figure out, that most everybody would be able to sort out um, fairly easily. So there is the uh, reveal aspect of it, uh, and that obviously did involve uh, a call. You know that I'm a big fan of the call, so once I knew what the card was, I did do a spread call uh, right in front of you. And uh, if I was to uh, determine uh, the one card, if I could go forward in life uh, doing card magic, but I was only ever allowed to do one card move ever again, it would always be the spread call over anything else uh, because of its, its um, uh, power as a utility to do all kinds of different things besides acquiring cards that can be used to force cards uh, and control cards. So um, that is what I did. However, uh, that is not the whole thing. I had to know which card to call, so that's what we're going to deal with on the other side of it. Uh, quickly, also to, uh, to deal with the reveal, uh, let's say that the card was the uh, uh, Queen of Diamonds. Uh, once that card was called uh, to the top of the deck, uh, you did catch on to the uh, injog idea, so the card was injogged as you can see here, and uh, and then the cards were spread um, with that injog being covered, uh, so very similar to uh, a Marlowe idea uh, where the cards are hidden via injog uh, underneath the spread, so uh, a little dirty here, but that's what happened. So once I know what the card is, I can injog it under the deck and then spread it such that it can't be seen anymore. But that one issue, how did I know what the card was? I had to dig really deep on this one uh, into the uh, probably the dirtiest thing I've ever done um, for a for a card effect besides using marked cards or something like that. That's pretty dirty. But uh, I used a shiner. That's how this was done. I used a shiner so that I wouldn't have to really handle the cards very much. Now. I would, if I was doing this with people, um, I could let them pick the card and look at it. Uh, I could let them, I could either let them pick the card and look at it on their own, or I could let them put it back in the, in the, into the uh, uh, spread on the table. But I would have to touch it at some point. That would be a, a requirement of using a shiner. Now, you, you might wonder, where's the shiner? Well, it's just, you know, for those of us who are betrothed, we... If you have a, a particular kind of wedding band, you probably have a shiner on you already. This is um, a fairly thick gold band, uh, and I found, uh, actually just in the, the uh, thinking of this trick, uh, trying to conceive of it, I, I found that uh, it actually works pretty good as a shiner. I went and I got uh, a, uh, a jewelry, a jewelry uh, cloth, 
and I did uh, shine this up quite a bit before I did this trick just to make sure that I could uh, see clearly enough. But I discovered that uh, I can see that bottom index fairly clearly. Uh, so if I cut into the deck here, uh, I can see, I'm, I'm holding it open here so, so I can show you, but I can see 10 of diamonds uh, um, on the inside of that. So if I'm holding it in my left hand and presenting in this way, which is where you probably got the thumb punch idea, the um, uh, crimp, um, that's not what I was doing. I was actually trying to read that bottom left uh, index from my perspective. And uh, that's how I did it. So I used a shiner to uh, see what the card was. Once I knew what the card was, it could have been uh, shuffled by anybody. And then it's just a matter of uh, uh, seeing the card in the spread as I'm talking about how I don't know what it is. Uh, uh, covering it with a cover card on, the, uh, on my right hand side of the spread and then culling it when the faces go down and then getting it to the top. So, so that was it. Um, using a shiner to find and locate a uh, selected card and identify it. Now this is a really important idea because um, it, I think it's, it's essential to separate kind of two halves of a pick a card kind of trick. Um, there is the acquisition of the card, and that's kind of one side of it, and then there's a the revelation. And if you have a really killer way to acquire the identity of cards, uh, like using a shiner like this, if you have a ring on all the time, you can really fry people's brains all night with all sorts of revelations. You can reveal cards in all kinds of clever ways. Um, and just be using the same methodology to determine uh, the identity. So, uh, you know, it, it could be a good peak, or it could be a shiner, it could be anything like that, but um, it, just knowing the identity means that really you can do an infinite number of tricks um, because the revelation is where the trick is seen. It's not really in the acquiring of a, a selected card name, but it's in how it is revealed at the end. Now, a couple things on the reveal. I just thought it was interesting to try to do a reveal in which there was no reveal. I think there's something unsettling about the fact that the name of the card is never said. Uh, that to a spectator having chosen something, only they know it, uh, and they've not, they're not saying what it is, and the magician, the performer, never says what it is. It's just, it's just not shown. It is uh, kind of uh, shown as not being present, and I think there's just something unsettling about that uh, to a lay person. So that was my thought and idea on that, uh, and presenting in that way, is not saying what it is, and just kind of showing uh, by elimination that it seems to be the only thing that isn't there. You can see all these other cards, uh, but for some reason the one card that was selected is missing, and you know, if they don't know what it is or where it was, how could that be? Um, this obviously could be turned over to the spectator. Uh, all you would want to do is you'd probably want to pick up the covering uh, packet first and bury it. So that way when they do go looking through it, they don't see their selected card right on top of the deck. Um, Obviously, when they look through the deck to examine it, if you did that, they would find their card in there. And I don't think that matters. It's not like you're making the card disappear permanently. You're just revealing by non-presentation of it in the moment. So the fact that it's there later really doesn't matter. I do, again, think that it is important that it not be marked if you're going to let people examine it. So my method does prevent uh, that from happening, uh, having to uh, crimp the card or mark it in any way. Um, one last idea is I did think of a way to do this trick uh, without having uh, to uh, hide it with a, an in-jog and a spread, um, without having to do this business. Uh, if you wanted to kind of gaff this, uh, one thing you could do is you could take a, uh, a key card, a top card probably, and put a double-sided piece of double-sided tape on it. Uh, so just lay a piece of double-sided tape on the top, uh, and then in your presentation you could show uh, the uh, cards as all being different. Uh, you could uh, do the, your, your table wash, but you would want to keep track of your uh, uh, tape card. Uh, allow them to select and try to keep this, you know, uh, controlled out of the way. You take a little bit of risk in this. But when you return it, you would just make sure that you drop it on the card that has the double stick and make sure that there's no separation between the two cards as they're gathered together. What you would do is you would automatically uh, adhere one to the other, and then you would be home free. You would be able to do a spread without seeing it. There's actually a lot of really, really great performances that use that um, double stick tape kind of principle. 
principle. I'm not really sure where it originates from, but it's an exceptional way to uh, be very open and, and kind of hands off in terms of moves uh, to make one card kind of disappear into the deck uh, for a presentation. Um, anyway. Uh, those are my thoughts on this. Uh, just a couple of other things very quickly. I'm really enjoying doing this. and uh, I'm a school teacher, and it is July, so that's why I'm able to uh, do a bunch of these all at one time here, so I'm having fun doing it. I think it's a nice format to be able to show a trick and let people just enjoy the trick without an explanation, at least for a little bit. Uh, and then follow up with that. Now, I won't keep doing this uh, permanently. We'll go back to some of the other kinds of videos where I just give straight-up tutorials. But uh, I do really like this format, and I think I plan on uh, continuing this into the future. So I'm having a lot of fun with this uh, idea. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to uh, say thanks again for participating and putting your comments out of there. I have a lot of fun. It's, it, it, I think it is fun to do a presentation like this where you're actually asking people to reveal uh, what they think about it. Um, it takes some of the snarkiness away of YouTube, I think, by doing it this way. There's so many times you'll do a, a, a presentation of a trick uh, and uh, right away people are trying to say what they think is going on uh, and try to put themselves above uh, the performer. Uh, I'm asking you to do that. I want you to try to tell me what you think. I think it's pretty uh, I think I think it's a good thing to get our brains working and thinking about all of the possibilities because in the comments what we end up finding are a bunch of great ideas that may not be what I use uh, but uh, some of those uh, ideas you come up with may help me to think about something else to present in the future and also may help each other in trying to consider what the possibilities are in, in the formulation of your own tricks. So uh, thank you again for participating. I hope you enjoyed this one and I can't wait to do uh, another one here in the future. Uh, have fun with this and I wish all of you happy magicking.